Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome all our <laughs> Torah Anytime viewers. This, first of all, we'd like to thank the Vanille family <laughs> for hosting. And like it was mentioned a few seconds ago, <laughs> maybe a merit for a shiduch for whoever needs. For whoever needs. And unfortunately, uh, now even uh, more than ever, uh, for whoever needs as well. Okay, so now, the, the way that I want to begin is, is to speak about, obviously, the, um, what everybody is speaking about. Um, and I mean, when I mean everybody, I'm talking about like there are people that are nonstop on news sites, and then every 30 seconds, refresh. Refresh. Maybe there's something more that I could be scared about. Refresh. And they keep on doing it. And this is causing a tremendous amount of confusion to the general population. Um, I, and if you realize, that I usually don't like to speak about current events. I usually don't. And I wasn't planning on speaking about this. But it happens to be that I wanted to speak about Emunah and Bitachon. And it's really the topic at hand that it really comes into play in this type of situation. So we're going to uh, plug in also the current events that's going on right now. Now, in general, the more information that you have, the more comfortable you are with certain scenarios. Sometimes it, works, it backfires. The more information that you have, the more scarier that you get. The problem over here is that there's so much <coughs> fake information that's going out there that no one really knows what to be scared about. Like no one knows what's right, what's wrong, like how contagious it is, how dangerous it is. And one of the reasons is, is that these are just people that are just publishing things without any research. But also that even the scientific world doesn't really know what's going on. It really doesn't. It's, it's, a, it's a new virus. So to give a little bit of a recap, whoever uh, just woke up from a coma and is tuning in, there is something called a uh, coronavirus right now. Um, corona, by the way, has nothing to do with the beer. It's just based on how it looks under a microscope, the corona from a crown. That's the way that the, the actual um, disease actually looks. So now, and that's why it also, uh, you, the scientific term is more COVID-19. Uh, COVID is C-O-V-I-D for C-O for corona, V-I for virus, and D for, for what was that, for that's disease or something, or just part of the virus, and then 19 for when it was found in 2019. So. This disease was first found in, uh, um, in Wuhan, China in, the, in December of 2019. And uh, what is a, number one, the, one of the first misconceptions that it came from the uh, animal food courts or whatever it was. That they, I mean, the Chinese, they eat everything that moves. So, or even if it doesn't move, they eat it. So they, it, they have this market and that's where they think the actual, they trace back to the actual first person that got it. It doesn't, it didn't, he wasn't associated with the, with, the, with that food market. Happens to be it is correlated to bats, but you know, and it could transfer back and forth, but the first person that contacted this, it, it does not seem from now, from, this, from the information that we have now, that it came from, um, from, from there. So, so for all those people that are doing gematrias on the, uh, you know, whatever, okay, whoever knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, so I'm not even gonna, I wasn't even planning on speaking about the gematrias of Mashiach. Um, I have a whole thing about that. The, way that it went, and then it took it to a whole nother level, is the World Health Organization uh, went and they announced this as a pandemic. Now when people hear something pandemic, they go crazy. And people have gone crazy, uh, you know, from this. Pandemic, if anybody knows what the actual definition of a pandemic, so, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, an epidemic is something that is basically spreads. Spreads throughout the community, spreads throughout. The, a, a pandemic is where you take that virus or whatever it is, and it's spread out through the entire world. But there's a key word when you're dealing with pandemic. It's talking about a worldwide outbreak of a new disease. That's what a pandemic is. We have the flu every single year. The flu is throughout the entire world. They don't call that a pandemic because that's not new. It's something that we had. So all that this is different than the flu is that it's new. Well, there's actually quite a few differences. But for this perspective, that the fact that it's a worldwide pandemic, that people are going crazy, people hear the words of the city is shutting down, you know, the government is going down, Bitcoin is falling, who knows what Bitcoin is, nobody knows, but it's falling, it must not be good. People are going crazy over stuff that they have no idea. So, and then that really what, you know, the big problem is when you don't know something, that's when it becomes very scary. If, for whoever has children, if you're calling your child 25 times and they don't answer, you are so worried. The second that they answer, that worry turns into brutal anger. You know, like instantly, like, I can't believe you did that. But because you don't know. When you don't know, you get very nervous. And when you don't know about something, also you get very nervous. You see everybody's going, they're buying the entire supermarkets. You don't know what's going on. Schools are closing down. You're pulling your hair out. There's so many things that just, that there's unknown. 
Now, when you look at this disease, this disease hasn't, Baruch Hashem, it hasn't mutated. It's exactly the same was since it, since it started, which is good, as of now. Um, the reason that the, you know, the, the world is, is taking this to such a you know, crazy extent is in China and in northern Italy, where it hit really hard, it, went, it basically went unchecked. And when it went unchecked, so it, it, it spread very, very quickly. And what happens is when it spread very, very quickly, a lot of people needed hospitalizations at the same time. The problem is you don't have enough. This is a this is a respiratory illness. So you need respirator, respirators. You need you know you know you need people to be intubated to have the tube you know down their lungs. There's things that are needed, but the problem is that when so many people get sick at at the same time, there's only a limit to how much beds a hospital has, to how much equipment the hospital has. Now, even though other countries may have extra equipment lying around, and in general situations, other countries will lend to other countries. Here's some extra equipment so you could use. Now everybody is so afraid that they want to keep everything for themselves. They don't know maybe will need it also. So what happens is, is that you have in places like China and Italy, where, or, and also Iran, where there is so much people that need hospitalization that they, don't ha they have to choose who they're going to save. Like certain people, I'll be like, we're sorry, we can't help you. So in order to try to prevent this, what they're trying to do is, and in fact, what I'm about, the goal, by the way, for me telling you this stuff is not to scare you, is really to educate you and to realize what you need to focus on and to make you feel better. That's really the goal of yours. But we will say some facts that will be scary, but I, I don't alter the facts. This is the facts as we have it right now, the research that I have done, the people that I've spoke to, so you know, take it uh, you know, as is. Now, the, um, you know, they go in these places and say people, let's say, that are above 70, I'm sorry, you don't make the checklist, you don't get the bed. And there are people that are literally there with the disease without any access to the medical care that they actually need. So what's happening? Now the entire world is thinking, okay, we know, and this is what they're saying, that we know a lot of people are going to get this. But what we need to do now is get, let it spread slowly. Because if it spreads slowly, then we can handle it. The hospitals can handle it. The people can handle it. The you know, medical staff can handle it. So let's do it slowly. And because we do it slowly, so then everybody, when they get sick in their due time, people, you know, the hospitals will be able to, you know, be able to handle it. Now, when you look at the, uh, you know, at the numbers, um, and by the way, this entire class is not an education on, on this. This is just, just so you understand something. The, um, the coronavirus, so right now, as of today, is th there was about 127,000 confirmed cases. Out of those 127,000 confirmed cases, 68,000 of those already are healed. They got it. And now they're and now they're better. But, uh, what is it? Like 4,000 or something? There was, uh, you know, about you know, there were deaths on it. Now, when people, you know, you have to realize how it transfers from person to person. I'm not going to go into the whole concept of, you know, with the face mask, because I have a whole, you know, thing of my idea, you know, on it. The, you know, the scientific people, the government telling you don't wear it. Um, and you do whatever it is that you uh, need to do. Chances are, when you're wearing it, you're doing it wrong anyways. Uh, just like when you're washing your just like when you're doing anything in life, right? So, uh, unless you really studied it and you really know what you're doing, you're most likely you're doing most it wrong. wear the mask backwards, by the way. <laughs> they do wear <laughs> yeah. Yeah, whatever it is, you know, to, if it makes them feel better, fine, so it gives you some menuchat and nefesh. But there's other ways to do it, which we'll discuss uh, now. The, um, the way that it works is, as of now, the way that it's transferred is through, um, it, it's, it's droplet, and in, in the hospital term it's known as droplet proportion, meaning that it goes through respiratory droplets. So if someone sneezes and coughs on you, I mean, don't drink bleach, which apparently people think can help. It can't. Do not drink bleach or anything else. Don't pu Purell in your mouth. But when someone spits or sneezes or things like that, with the droplet is the liquid. So when liquid goes from one to that, it can go from the table, it go from different things, from the food. So you, you have to be careful on those aspects of it. But it's not, it's not airborne as far as they know right now. It's not airborne that it just goes in the air and somebody could you know, transfer it, get it you know, from 20 feet away. Uh, the CDC, if I'm not mistaken, says up to six feet away. You should stay away from people. I mean, whatever. I'm saying sick people. Yeah, obviously, you know, if you're going to have a you know, measuring stick everywhere you walk and be like, hey, stay. So the other option that you have is just start coughing and you will get six feet, uh, you know, near you. The, obviously, it's better to avoid direct contact with people and, um, and, and regarding contaminated surfaces, if let's say someone spits or sneezes, it actually could stay for quite, depending if it's copper, steel or glass or cardboard, there's different, you know, time frames that it could actually stay on it. But general, these are not things that you should worry about because these are things that, that are not going to make it. Obviously, if you're, uh, you know, I would say don't lick the subways if that's something that you do. Um, if, you know, someone sneezes, you know, don't put it under a microscope. Just stay away from the regular, basic, normal, day-to-day -day things. Now, the 
part that I'm about to tell you is a little bit scary, but this is the truth, so I want to tell you what is as is right now, and then we will go focus a little bit on, on a little bit of a different angle. This coronavirus happens to be, it is two to three times more contagious than flu. So it is different than the flu. It is 10 to 30 times as deadly, um, which means is that they do anticipate tremendous amount of deaths, uh, you know, because of this. Bezat Hashem, it will go away just like it came, but this is where they're anticipating and this is why they're having such, you know, even the government is having such tremendous amount of, of panic. Now, the government doesn't always tell you the information. All you hear is the stuff that you're maybe reading and whatever it is that you, the source of news that you're getting from, and it trickles down to the point that you don't even know, you don't understand what you're, you're dealing with over here. So, even though these numbers are very, very high, the majority of people that get this have very mild symptoms. So these numbers are not really accurate because there could be so many millions of people that already have it that don't know, and they're not even aware of it. So this is where it comes that it, there's a big, big machloket in the government, in the medical, should you close off schools, should you go send people home, should you not? There's a big, some people say, yeah, you have to close everything off. Other people say, no, you can't. And in fact, one of the reasons why people say not to close things off is because you have nurses and doctors in the hospitals that have kids. What's going to happen if the school sends them home? Where, how are they going to? How are they going to be able to work? How are they going to be able to take care of the sick patients? So, uh, you know, it's going to hurt the economy. There's different things, which is not really true, which is not really the correct way that you need to think about it. But this is where all the machlokas is coming in. The bottom line is like this: that if somebody, God forbid, has certain symptoms like fever, a dry cough, um, you know, aching of the of the bones, the fatigue, they have breathing difficulties, stay home. That's why you, you know, don't start going with your emunah bitachon. I'm going to go to pray with a minyan, whatever it is. I'm, go seek medical help right then and there. Don't say that you're going to go to you know shiurei torah. You got to do what you need to do. The first thing that you need to do is seek medical help. If it's nothing, if it's a common cold, then fine. Do whatever it is that you need to do. Just know that no one's going to be sitting next to you. The second that you have a cold, and I, like I said, and before we started recording, you know what happened? You know, in, in you know in shul just a few hours ago, one person started coughing. He had Al Dal Ramos. No, nobody was near him. So, oh, you have no idea. You see, yeah, yeah, it's 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 going beyond the the. But but the problem is that people go. And they misrepresent what, now let's focus on the Torah. Now that we have this understanding on it, or, or this you know, current understanding, everything is going to constantly change as, as it does in the scientific world. The Ramah says in Yoreda, the, 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 the brings it down in Shulchan Aruch, that you know, if there is a Magafa, if there's a, you know, a, you know, an epidemic, a pandemic, or there's, there's a, uh, a Magafa, is, um, a plague, thank you. There, if there is a plague, then you have to take care of yourself. You can't rely on these seem. You can't rely on miracles. You can't be one of those people that go, okay, you know, I have a cold, a cough, but uh, let me go and, you know, I'm going to go and start whatever it is, going into the community and doing it, whatever it is I do. You have to take care of yourself. And this includes that if, let's say, you need to stock up on some things, people are like, not sure, should I stock up, should I not stock up? If you want to ask my personal opinion, the only reason why I say you should stock up is because everybody else is buying stuff and you're not going to have anything. It's not because you need it as of now, but it's just because there's been nothing left. Uh, you know, I understand why people are buying hand sanitizer. I understand why people are buying antimicrobial, antibacterial soaps. Makes 100%. What I don't understand, and I have... Oh, so you also have the same questions. They had a thing. You bought all the toilet paper, but I have a bunch. I don't know how... Uh, how the toilet paper industry, the toilet paper industry somehow with the best business, I, I don't know how they got into this. You know, it was, it was run by Purell and Lysol until this time. Now, the, you know, Charmin got in there somehow, um, you know, and, but I don't understand, like, what are you, like, what are you doing with all the, I don't, I've been to the, you know, before I came here, I went to the store, I had to buy a few things. There was a few sections that was surrounded with people. First of all, the entire toilet paper section, gone. There was no toilet paper, forget about it. Purell section, gone, but that I knew. The, but what I didn't understand is you had people in the dying here section. I'm like, this is what I... I a group, there was so many people going and look. I'm like, oh, I don't understand. I'm like, maybe that's the next thing, I don't know. You got the toilet paper, now you got dying here. Like, people are going crazy. So I was asking... I was asking, right, water, because people don't know what sink is, you know, it actually comes free. The, you want to know what I tell you, what, what I think you should do, is buy a water filter. And then you don't have to stop all this water, at least for now. But regardless of that, you, you have to understand, why are people doing this? So why are people doing this? I'll tell you one of the shatim that was told to me, one of the reasons that was told to me. Why are people going? Because they feel they need to do something. 
So if the alien ate to do something, so it's go. I don't know. I, I have no idea the thing with toilet paper. I, I don't know what they think. Because if you're quarantined, you're quarantined for two weeks. Yeah. So you're doing something. Exactly. So if you're doing something, aha. Uh -huh. So now I'm doing it. But now what are you doing? Because now everybody's doing it. So now you have to do it. So yeah, this is where everything works around. For all you know, the next thing, uh, we could start a thing right here, right now. For all the people online. Like, just say the product, and I'll be like, everybody has to get canned beans. Like that's in like canned beans are gonna go off the shelves. And the second that people hear that everyone's buying canned beans, so everyone's gonna buy canned beans. But why is everyone buying? No one knows. I don't know. Everyone's else doing it. You know, <laughs> you, you think about it. Ten years, so I'm you when you know what I saw something very very cute that what it really it says what really people should be buying is matzos. Right. right. Yeah. Because matzos, you don't need toilet paper. It, you know, it stays in your system. It stays for four years. It's good. It, matzo should be flying off the shelf. But what? Toilet paper. That's where we draw the lines. As Americans, I don't know what people are thinking. I have no idea. I, I, I can't begin to comprehend. I, I don't know why. Like it, and it bothers me. Like it, it physically bothers. Like like I like speak sometimes to me. Like I I don't know what's going on. So if you want to stock up, stock up on things just because you have people with mishugas in their heads that they're buying everything out. So at least you'll have something. But, you know, so, so do the normal things that you need to do, but don't go too crazy over this. The real, the real aspect, when people want, and they're going and they're buying all this toilet paper, they're buying something, is because they want to do something. The way that it should be done as a Jew, as an Orthodox Jew, someone who follows the Torah, mitzvot masim tovim, is you have to, first of all, you have to do your shtadut. But secondly, there's an aspect of emunah. There's an aspect of emunah, but before we even get to the emunah, there's also an aspect of worrying and stress. If somebody's stressed and becomes anxious on this, we know through scientific studies that the, the anxiety of worrying actually lowers your immune system. So it makes you more prone to sickness by the fact that you're going and you're worrying on certain things. So really what, what you should be doing, and this is what Rabbeinu Yonah says, Rabbeinu Yonah says you, you, but by people going and they're worrying about their, oh, their, their future of what's gonna, they're worrying about all these problems, you have all these hypochondriacs, every time someone sneezes they think they probably got, like, like on, on people that have that disease, because now they constantly think that they're gonna have that. But when somebody constantly thinks that they have an issue, what's gonna be, eventually, that's going to cause them to have that issue. It doesn't have to be, maybe not coronavirus, but there's so many other things that people can lower their immune system and it causes them tremendous amount of problems. So the first thing that you need to do as an Orthodox Jew is, first of all, you do your shtadut. After that, you have to have a certain level of emunah, abidachon. There's a level that you have to have when you realize that you've done what you could do and now you move on in life. You have to be calm, you have to be relaxed. The, um, whenever, whenever we have a play, you ever have Signs. This is obviously a sign from God. There's so many lessons that we could get, you know, into this. Just, you know, just like from like one aspect. I don't want to get too much into this. Where, where you look and how you have that God took a tiny micro, like this tiny, tiny disease, and shut down the entire world with it. Shut, the entire world is shut down. Countries are on like, like like serious lockdowns, like they could only go out, only pharmacies and supermarkets are open. Like you have, you, have, you have entire cities that are secluded to themselves. So you look at the power of what God can do with a tiny little thing, a tiny little microbe, a tiny little nothing. Uh, you know, there are people that go, another like false fact, where they think that, you know, people say that it was, uh, it was manufactured in China because Wuhan has things that they have over there, they have biological weapons in that area and it was manufactured in China and really it's a Chinese guy back. You know what, you know what, you know what, the, the, my most favorite response to this is that there was uh, um, some scientist that says, says you're giving human beings too much credit. It says human beings cannot create something so sophisticated and so productive as a disease as like this. Like we're not that good. Like even the scientist knows that this has nothing to do with the human. This is, has to do, they, obviously they don't say God because, you know, chas v'shalom, that God forbid they could say God. You know, so they, what they do is they, you know, they just happened to happen or jumped in. But the truth is, everything that happens in our lives comes from a HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now if everything happens, that, that, everything that comes in your life happens to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that means that whoever's going to get sick, is supposed to get sick. Whoever wasn't supposed to get wasn't supposed to get sick. Obviously, you have to do ishtadlut, like I said before. Don't lick the subways. You know, don't, you know, the way the rabbi Victor Miller goes and explains a, you know, an, a, you know, a pandemic or an epidemic, he's like, you know, don't go around to a bunch of, where, where if you're sick, to a bunch of other people, because then you're sharing your germs. What is it? So you're donating your germs, and then people are donating their germs, and then it's a pool of donation of germs. It's like, you have to be, obviously, be smart. You have to do a, your ishtadlut on it. But once you're doing your salut, what is the next step? How is it that you're supposed to, you're supposed to deal? And this is where emunah comes in. So you have the concept of emunah, 
And that is nice. Emuna is an intellectual understanding that there is God and everything that I just said. Very intellectual. Everything, you know, that God has a direct, you know, every missile, every, every sneeze has a direct, you know, target. <laughs> everything has a direct, every situation in your life is directed to, to you or not to you. Now, that's theoretical, but how do you take it practical? How do you take it practical? And that is the difference between emunah and bidachon. Emunah is something that's theoretical. I understand the concept, I understand what it needs to be done, I understand the applications of it. Bitachon is where you internalize that and it becomes a reality towards you. The famous story regarding the difference between emunah and bitachon is regarding the, the tight world walker. We have a guy who goes upon two mountains or two skyscrapers, depending on when the story was told, mm -hmm. and he takes a, a wire and he ties it across from both, both ends. And there's a group of people that are hovering around, and the type of broker, a lot of people in show business, they, they need the, the kavod, I don't know what he wants, I don't, I don't want to say the wrong thing, they need the, the kavod, they need the, the enthusiasm from the crowd. So they go, whatever it is. So this tightrope goes and he says, Do you think I can do this? And everyone's like, No, you're crazy. Call the people in the white coats. You're nuts. You know, he probably has, you know, he, who knows what's going on with this guy. Something went into his head. And he goes and he steps on the wire and everyone's like, <gasps> And they don't breathe. Because apparently if he drops, you're not going to have any, whatever it is. And people are just shocked. And then he takes another step and another step and another step. And then he makes it across and everyone, oh, sigh of relief. And then everyone's like, round of applause, they clap. Then he goes in and says, do you think I could do it again? And then most people are like, you're crazy, stop doing it. And some people are like, well, yeah, maybe. And then he goes and he says, do you think I could do it backwards? Like, just stepping backwards. I don't know what, yeah, not like on your hands. So he goes and people are like, maybe yeah, maybe not. Don't do it, you're crazy. And he does it backwards. And everybody's like, oh, that's crazy. Then he goes and he starts on, you know, on his third try. He's like, do you think I could do this while walking on a wheelbarrow or a wheel? And everyone's like, definitely not. You are going to die. You are definitely 100% mortality rate. You are going to die. And he goes and he gets on this wheelbarrow and he starts walking across. And he gets across the entire thing and the crowd goes crazy. By this time, they have such a muna on this guy. This guy is the best type of broker they've ever seen. And then he goes and he says, all right, do you think I could do this with somebody inside the wheelbarrow? And everyone's like, what? Like, definitely not. But we would like to see that. They were, you know, very insane. So he's like, okay, who wants to go inside the wheelbarrow? You know, like, I mean, we know you could do it. I mean, we've seen you. You know, you're really good. But like, you know, like going inside, nah, nah I'm not, it's not for me. Maybe you want to go? Oh, no, you want to you go? No, nobody wants to go inside. Everybody has them now. They know that this guy could do it. If he did until now, he could probably do it with people inside. All of a sudden, a little girl raises her hand and she says, I'll do it. And everyone's like, little girl, you know, what are you doing? You're crazy. You know, like all of it, two seconds ago, they said that he could do it. But the second that they see something, it becomes a reality. They're like, no, 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 no. You don't do it. What's your mother going to say? You know, like you can't, you know, go do it. And she doesn't listen to everybody. And she goes up to, onto the skyscraper, the mountains, and she goes and she gets into the wheelbarrow. She goes into the wheelbarrow and he takes one step after another step after another step and he makes it across. And the crowd goes crazy. They throw off their hats. They give him money. They do whatever it is. Everybody's like, you know, praising him. Unbelievable. But the first thing is that they ran into the little girl. And they said, little girl, how did you have the courage to go inside this barrel? How were you able to do that? And the little girl said it was very simple. He says, that person who was on top, who was walking, the typer walker, he's my father. And I have trust that my father is going to make sure that I don't fall down. And they're like, well, you know, like that, that's unbelievable. So when we think about it, when we have emunah and bitachon, we have to realize that who's taking the steps for us? It's God. So when you have emunah, you are the people over there that's saying, yeah, you could do it. God can do anything. Yeah, God could save the entire Italy and China and who knows what. But the second that it gets affected into you, all of a sudden, we're like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm not going to go inside the wheelbarrow. Maybe somebody else will do it, but not me. So you have emunah, the theoretical. Bitachon is where you feel confident enough in God that you're going to go inside the wheelbarrow. And I'm not, again, don't lick the subways. Like, the, let's make that very clear. Don't say, like, I have a banana bit of in God, I'm not going to get sick. You know, you know, and start doing things that are silly. You have to, have to obviously be normal about it. But the difference is, is where your where, where the imuna internalizes. Does it stay theoretical or does it turn into bitachon where it becomes practical? Then they went over and they asked this tightrope broker. He says, uh, okay, we understand how you, but like, how did you do that? Like, how did you go and put your daughter in here and walk across it? Like, how did you end up doing that? And he said, when I'm on the rope, I only look at the next step. I don't look, you know, what's going to happen, you know, in 30 steps or 50 steps or the full. I don't look at anything except where I am going to take the next step. When we deal in our lives and the problems in the, in the, in the, 
tribulations and the, the situations that we're dealing with, sometimes even when someone's going becoming a Baal Shuvah, and they're like, okay, how could I ever be so religious? How? And it's, sometimes it's very difficult, but you have to focus the next step. Where are you going to take the next step? That's where you're focusing in your life. If, you're, you're, if your level at Munah B'dachon is not, let's say, where it should be, so what is the next step that you're going to do? People go and they think that I'm never going to be able to make it across, so why do I even start? And that's wrong. You have to figure out one step at a time. And if you want to plug it into somewhere that's current, plug it into the coronavirus. Like, how confident do you feel in HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Now again, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do Yishtadlut. And again, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't go and do, you know what the Chachamim tells us, when there's something bad comes onto us, we have to do tshuva. That, that's really, you want to feel like you're doing something, put the toilet paper down. Just, just like relax with the toilet paper. Do tshuva. Maybe think, maybe let me take upon myself something. Bishut, the Corona, right? All of a sudden the Corona is going, uh, um, you know, taking, taking a, a level. I mean, listen, it already made... It already made it to a pandemic. Corona is doing very well for itself. So, but now, let's take it to a spiritual aspect of it. What are you going to do instead of you want to do something? So instead of focusing on something that you're going to be able to do in the physical sense, maybe focus on something where the true power lies. And that is an HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What is it that you're going to do? Rabbi Victor Miller goes, and he says there's a difference between perfect faith and true knowledge. So when somebody has uh, perfect faith, he gives an example like this. Let's say a little boy. His mother goes over to him and says, don't touch fire. Now he knows with perfect faith, right, Ben he knows that he, you know, fire is dangerous. It's going to hurt him. His mother told him, and he trusts his mother. He's a little boy. He doesn't know any better. No, I'm just kidding. He really knows better. He trusts his mother. And he says, listen, if my mommy told me that I shouldn't touch fire, I'm not going to touch fire because it says it's going to make me a boo-boo. It's going to hurt me. And he doesn't want to touch fire. But what happens if accidentally, God forbid, one time he touches fire? And he feels the pain. All of a sudden, that went from perfect faith to all of a sudden to true knowledge. All of a sudden, he understands fire a lot different than when the mother told him beforehand, even though he trusted his mother 100%. And this, I can tell you personally, that happened with my, my youngest son. Um, one time we were driving, it was a long drive, two, three hours. And we stopped, we stopped the car and we're going. And my, my son was at the time, maybe he was two years old, maybe two years old. And he was about to touch the wheel. And I said, don't touch the wheel. My thought was, because it's dirty. I was like, don't touch the wheel. But, you know, like a little kid, you know, by the time, it, you know, he went and he touched the wheel. And I didn't realize, I never knew this, that when you're driving for a long time, the wheel actually becomes very hot. Because it's spinning so long for such a period of time, it became very hot. He screamed so, like he had blisters all over his hands. We had to rush it under the water for so long. And he was maybe two years old. Till this day, and this was maybe uh, two, three years ago, till this day, he, still, he sees a wheel, he knows it's hot. He remembers the lesson that was taught to him because he touched it. He knows it's like the wheel is hot. He would tell my other sibling, you know, by the by, my other, my other children, don't touch the wheel, it's very, very hot. And, and you're like, he, you know, he was a tiny, he was not, he was like a little, you know, like he barely spoke, you know, words, but he remembered it because what's the difference? If I were to tell him the wheel is hot, Okay, fine. Okay, like, I'm not going to touch because the wheel is hot. But he remembered the pain. The pain, oh, he felt it. It became real to him. When it became real to him, all of a sudden, he knew not to touch it. So the difference over here is, is when you're dealing with emunah, there's a general, it's, a, it's an intellectual concept. Yeah, you know that you shouldn't be nervous. You know that it's all God. You know, but when it's bitachon, it changes from something that is perfect faith to something that becomes true knowledge. It becomes a solid fact. When it becomes a solid fact that God controls the world and God decides who's going to get sick, you're going to feel very different. And, uh, and by the way, it's easy for me to say that. It's very easy to say that, and it's very easy to hear it, but it's very difficult to internalize it. Every single one of us, this is something that we need to work on, and work on internalizing the aspect of that God is the true source of power. The, the way that the, the disease gets spread is by God's command. If God said, let it spread, then it was going to spread. If God could come, tomorrow the entire disease could go away. And people have no idea. It's happened to SARS, it happened to MERS, it happened to so many different things. It just came, and then suddenly it disappeared. And it came from the same type of illness. Similar type of illness, I shouldn't say the same. Similar type, of, uh, similar type of illness. But what happens is, when God is not real to us, and then it's, it's very difficult for us to cope. It's very difficult for us to cope. When we go, think about somebody goes and starts praying. And what happens? So you're starting to pray, right? Assuming that you're religious, you know the prayers, you know what you're doing. So you're taking, you're starting Shemona, so you take three steps back, you come in, you know, you start Baruch Hashem, and then all of a sudden, you remember about the guy or the person that you're dating. I'd be like, what should I do with him? 
you know, before you know it, you're hitting yourself, you're like, you're shocked, like, oh, what just happened? Where am I up? Oh, I'm right up to here. You know, like, and you're going and you're already thinking about this. And then, you know, about 30 seconds later, finally you think about, wait a bit, about what's happening in my office? You know, like, what am I going to do with my boss? What am I going to do with this? And then you realize that you have to pay rent and this and you're not ready yet. And blah, blah, blah. You have all these things. Before you know it, you're done, Shmonesa. And you're all like, wow, that was, uh, that was unbelievable. You don't remember saying one word. I mean, but you said it, but you don't remember saying it. You know, like you were there, but you were not really there. Like, you know, what's, you know, what's happening? Now imagine somebody goes and has financial problems and he goes and he decides he's going to go and he's going to pray to God. But the second that he starts praying, all these thoughts pop into his head. He finishes praying, good or not good, irrelevant. He goes and he walks down the street. And all of a sudden, he sees a wealthy relative come past by him. And he's like, my wealthy relative, I've completely forgot about it. He runs over to him and says, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you lend me $10,000? And the wealthy relative says, yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll lend you, you know, just call my office tomorrow, we'll work it out. How does he feel after he leaves his, his, his relative? He feels so happy, everything is taken care of. He didn't get the check yet. He didn't get the money yet. But he feels happy. How does a person feel after they prayed for something? I don't know, this doesn't really work, I've been doing it for so long, no God's not listening to me, you know, what am I doing wrong, you know, like, so when you go at, when, after you finish praying to God, you're like, okay, whatever, you don't, you know, maybe you feel better, depending, you know, on the level of therapy that you had over there, and with God, and the, how much cries and tears you had, but when you speak all of a sudden to someone, you know, physical, all of a sudden it becomes real, regardless of whether they helped you or not yet. So what's the difference over here? Because your, your wealthy relative, that's real, that's physical, that's tangible. God is something intellectual. God is something on, on, on a different level. The tzaddikim, when they finished praying, they didn't worry about anything else. They were done, and they, that's it. They, they, they moved on. They felt as comfortable, if not more, than if somebody would have went over to them and says, I'll take care of all your problems. Because they felt that they did, they did what they needed to do. And we realize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is more compassionate, has more mercy than anybody alive. And if you need to get something, God could take care of that. No questions asked. Now, the aspect of where it comes into Judaism is something very, very interesting. When you go and let's say you make Kiddush on, you make Kiddush on Friday night, how come we make Kiddush on wine? How come when someone does, wants to do a Sudat Odaya, someone wants to do a, a, they give thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, they give people, you know, food to eat. Why don't they gather everybody around and let's all say Tehillim to thank God. Like why don't you say Kiddush over Tehillim or over a Gemara? Why are we saying it over something that's, you know, wine, something that you're eating, something that you could taste? And the answer is, is because you have something that if you would go and you say it over Tehillim or Gemara, that's, that's a, like a, like a, like you talk, a philosophical, you know, testimony that there is a God. But there's a difference between when it becomes philosophical and when it turns into tangible reality. Wine is tangible. Food is tangible. When you're giving thanks to God, you're, sh you're showing the tangibility of it. You're showing the realness of what it is. This is what happens. This is how Tzadikim, you know, this is how they live. When the brothers, when the Shvatim, when they went and they came back to Yosef, and they're like, the money that we paid for our food is in our sacks. And what were they told? They were told that it was a gift from God. Shouldn't they normally say like, wait a minute, like really? Like you probably put it back. You know, like come on. You know, like, but they were like, no, yeah, I'll give it to God. Does that make sense? You know, imagine you're going and you take, you know, you went with $1,000 in your purse and you went, to, you wanted to buy something, right? Obviously it was toilet paper. You went and you wanted to spend a thousand dollars in toilet paper, right? So you go and you buy this item and you spend, you put the, you put the thousand dollars. You get back home, you see the thousand dollars is back in your, in your wallet. You run back to the store and be like, did I pay for this? And be like, yeah, of course you paid for it. But like, I have the money in my thing. Must have been a gift from God. Would you have been like, yeah, I guess you're right. If you're honest, you'd be like, wait a minute, no, like, you, did you put it back? Like, what's going on over here? Did you, like, the brothers, the Shvatim, they were not, they were like, yeah, that makes sense. Why did they say, yeah, that makes sense? They weren't honest, but they were very honest. But they realized that they saw God so real that it was completely normal for them to have the money put back in their sacks. Yeah, why not? God does miracles for us all the time. Just like God said that the vinegar shall light, the oil shall light, the vinegar will light. There's no difference whatsoever. That's what reality is. That's what emunah, that's what a bitachon turns into. So now... When you go and you have people going and they're thinking, they're learning about emunah and they're understanding about bitachon and thinking, it's very easy to deal with emunah and bitachon when it's easy to deal with emunah and bitachon. But when all of a sudden something becomes trying, something becomes difficult, this is the great litmus test to see your level of emunah and bitachon. Coronavirus, right? Testing your level. The testing of what, you do, what it is that you need to do. When you think about it, you have somebody that let's say is a very successful businessman. 
and everything is great. And he's learning Emunah Bitochon. He's like, yeah, everything's from God. Everything's amazing. Everything's good. Everything is great. All of a sudden, he hears that he has a competitor opening up down the street. What happened to his Emunah Bitochon? So it depends on the level. But imagine this particular person. He goes and says, what? This guy is uh, opening up? He's like, can you find out more information? Calls, you know, the department of it, you know, this and the department of that and be like, are you sure? Is he legal? Is he able to? All of a sudden, he's like, wait a minute. What happened to your Emunah Bitochon? He says, no, really, my Emunah Bitochon is, yeah, we're built. Uh, it's L'Shem Shemayim, this is really, I support so many Shivot, I, you know, like, who knows what people go and start making excuses. Now, what happens is, is that his Emunah actually becomes a fake Emunah. Somebody who has real Emunah Bitochon, if somebody's opening up a, a, a competing business right next door to you, you help them out. That's, that's a level, I mean, it's a level, I'm, you know, that's, a, that's something that we have to work on. But when somebody goes and thinks that they have Emunah Bitochon, and all of a sudden they're nervous, that they have, you know, a competitor opening up right next door to them. So that means that their emunah bitachon is not real. It's something that is fake. And someone who has fake emunah bitachon is so much worse than somebody who has no emunah bitachon. Because they utilize their emunah bitachon to what? To the negative aspects of it. They co and they're able to convince that everything that they're doing is really the shem shemayin, and they're going co completely opposite of the way that they need to go. Now, this says Rabbi Victor Miller. He says, how do you work on something like this? When you go, and you get, yeah. Of how do you make, which? Like fake Emunah like Bitochon. When somebody goes, fake Emunah Bitochon means that they, intellectually, they understand the concept. That they say that there is Emunah Bitochon and everything is that, you know, what they do. But all of a sudden, when they get tested in life, in their Emunah Bitochon, whether it is in their dating life, what, what it means to get tested in that aspect is that something doesn't go your way or you're tested that you're nervous about what's going to happen. So all of a sudden, instead of your high level of Munah B'dachon, you're questioning everything, you're doing things, which is you're allowed to do, but where it comes problematic is where you do things illegally, halakhically illegally, right? You're doing things that are against the Torah. So which means when you're taking your Munah B'dachon and you're going against the Torah from it, that means that your Munah B'dachon is not real, it's fake. That's like a person in the business story that he has a business, he has, he thinks he has really Munah B'dachon, but now, instead of utilizing that to go and help the other person, he goes and tries to trash the other person. He tries to badmouth the other person. He tries to go and make it, you know, problematic for them. You know, there, I don't, I don't want to get too much into details on the dating world, because there's sometimes in the dating world that you're required to tell, you know, somebody who, let's say somebody calls up, you know, you regarding a certain friend or someone that you know. And you know this person has psychological problems, like serious problems. So then people think, okay, you know, what's the, you have to ask, first of all, ask, ask a question. Ask a local, your local Orthodox rabbi what is you should do in a particular situation. But the majority of times, if there's a real issue, you are required to say. And if you don't, people think, okay, no, I don't want to speak to Lashon I don't want to do this, I don't do that, and think you're doing the right thing. So you have to know where, it, where, the, the, where you draw the line, and that is where you go when you speak to a local Orthodox rabbi. But when you start using the Torah to go and try to can get you out of doing things, maybe that maybe it will be uncomfortable, somebody who's doing a, 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 you know, a sin, and you're like, you know what, I don't want to tell them, I don't want to give them Musal, because if I go and give them Musal, they're not really going to listen, maybe they won't listen, maybe they're going to hate me, I'm not going to be able to do Kiruv, I'm not going to, and before you know it, you're actually buying for them the, you know, the stuff that, the, you know, they shouldn't be doing. So obviously in all situations, you have to go and you have to ask a local Orthodox rabbi, but when you start realizing that you're doing things that are against the Torah, and you think that that's where, you're, that's where it becomes like a fake bitachon, fake emunah. So now, says Rabbi Victor Miller, that when someone goes and says Shema Yisrael, what should they think about when they say Shema Yisrael? So first thing that they need to do is they have to think about the literal translation of what Shema Yisrael means. That there's one God, you know, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Ekinu, Hashem Echad. There's one God, right? The next thing that they need to think about, says Rabbi Victor Miller, is that there's one God. So that one God is in Brooklyn. That one God is in Tokyo. That one God is in Wuhan, China. That one God is everywhere. The same, from the North Pole to the South Pole, God, that's the same God. And God could take care of you here, God could take care of you there. No matter where you are, how bad you have it, how sick you are, that God can take care of it. The, the Hashem Echad means He's everywhere and He has the power to do anything. That's, that's the concept that you have to focus on. Now, when people go and they work on this, it becomes to a different level. There was once a, a poor Jew who is sitting by the train station. And as he's sitting by the train station, you know, there are people that are coming past by and they're also waiting for the train. And, and one individual sits down next to him and he says, which, where are you going to? He says, I'm going to a certain, uh, you know, place. And he's like, oh, me too. That's all, you know, and he sits down next to him. After a while, the train comes by. And as the train comes by, the guy gets up, the guy who, you know, who, was, who came sat down, you know, second, he gets up and he says, you know, the train is here, you're not gonna go? 
And this poor Jew was sitting right next to him. He says, no, you know, I'm not going to go. He says, but I thought you're going to the same location. You're not, you're not taking this train? He's like, yeah, I, I need to take this train, but I'm not, I'm not getting up. He's like, why not? He says, I don't have a ticket. He's like, so buy a ticket. He's like, I don't have any money. He says, what are you doing over here? He says, you know, God will take care of me. You know, like whatever. You know, I need this where I need to go, so this is where I am. I have to stay over here. And he's like, what do you mean? You're, gonna, you're coming here without any money? How are you going to get on the train? He's like, you should have your God will help. Don't worry about it. He says, I'm not worried about it, but you're worried about it. You're like, you should be worried about it. Why are you not worried about it? And he's like, yeah, this is what I need. This is where I need to do. This is my shadow. So he says, fine. He says, if that says, you know, may God, uh, you know, bless you. And he goes on the train. He's sitting on the train. He gets a seat and he's watching this poor man. This poor man is sitting over there. The train conductor says, we're leaving in 10 minutes. This guy's looking, the guy's still relaxing on the bench over there like no one's business. Five minutes, the guy's relaxing, he's, uh, he's taking out his pipe, he's, you know, enjoying himself. And finally, the train is about to leave for two minutes, and the guy screams out, he says, what are you going to do? You're going to miss the train. He says, oh, if I miss the train, I miss the train. Says, you know, what, what can I do? And the train is about to leave. Finally, this guy opens the window and says, come here quickly, come here, come here. And he gives him money, and he says, go buy a ticket quickly and get on the train. You're going to miss it. And he says, fine, he takes the ticket and he goes and he purchases it and he gets, he, you know, and he gets on the train. And he goes and this guy, and he sits down next to his benefactor who bought him the ticket. And he says, what would have happened if I wouldn't have gave you the ticket? He says, I got you the ticket. And he says, what do you mean you got me the ticket? He says, God gave me the, you know, God gave me the ticket. It's like the story that happened in the Kotel, in the Kosel, many, many years ago before there was uh, internet, uh, uh, you know. You know, when people are so holy, what can I tell you? Um, and, uh, you know, people, you know, there was no, before even there were cell phones, there was a guy in the coastal, he was sitting there and he was crying. Like, one of those guys that you could tell, like, very fresh to Judaism, he got one of those staple yarmulkes, you know, that, you know, connected like an idea, whatever. You know, like, he gets over there, second you sneeze, it takes off like a kite. So, he gets over there and he starts praying in the coastal. There was one, there was, near the coastal, there was a lot of yeshivas. There was one guy who was walking past by, there was praying, and he hears this, like, American guy praying to God, like with so much emotion, he's crying, he's praying, and he's like, you know what, uh, like people get a little bit, you know, I'm not saying you should do this, but some people go and they like to read the notes and be like, all right, let's see, you know, what Santa's going to give you this year, you know, and he, go, and he goes and he's listening over to what this person is saying, and he says, God, he says, and he overhears this person, he says, God, I am a huge Jet fan, and I need to know there's a playoffs right now, please send me a sign of what's going on, I need to know the score. And the guy's listening to this, and he's like, he's like, and he has like a brilliant plan. He's like, this is amazing. He runs over to his dorm, which if I'm not mistaken, he was an H. So he runs over to him, which was like really, a, you know, across that plaza. So he runs up, and back then, it was so expensive to call America, because it was, you know, those like pay phone, you had like, you know, who knows how many dollars per minute. He's like, this is worth it, it's gonna be great. He calls America, he calls somebody, who, he's like, listen, you gotta do me a favor, find out what the jet score is right now. Every second counts. Come on, hurry up. This is expensive. And the guy goes and turns on the radio. He finds the score and he tells it to him. The guy says, thanks so much. Hangs up, runs back to the coastal. The guy is still praying. That guy is obviously was devoted. And he's still praying. The guy goes up and he taps him on his shoulder. And this guy with the paper yarmulke turns around and says, you know, can I help you? He's like wiping away his tears. You know, he's like, this is an allergy. You know, like, can I help you? And he's like, um, yeah, I says, I, this yeshiva bachar goes, yeshiva boy goes, and he says, I don't know why. He's like playing it. He's like, you know, it's like, and scene. You know, like he's, in, in, he's like, I don't know why, but I have this like weird, you know, you know, reason to like tell you the Jets are up seven to zero. And the guy's like, <gasps> <laughs> I think I just turns away. And he, it, the guy, the second turns away, he's rolling, he's laughing so hard. And the guy is like shocked by the Koso, right? I, I don't know if the story ends and the guy that calls became big Rosh Hashiva, like who knows? But like he goes and the Shiva boy goes and he goes back to his dorm and he starts rolling. He's like, that's the best 30 bucks I ever spent. I don't know whatever. He's like, and they're laughing and he's telling his friends and they're all laughing. And the Rosh Hashiva, the rat, one of the rabbis walked past by and they're like, what are you laughing about? So the boy tells him the whole story. He says, I was walking and then I heard this guy and I ran and I got the information. He thinks God answered. It's like, it was like, hilarious. And the rabbi's like, yeah, God did answer him. He's like, you are the messenger, you fool. Like, why you, can't you see that? <laughs> like, you think you tricked him? Like, you think you worked it out? He's like, God wanted to answer his prayer. He used you to eavesdrop and then he went to you and you had to pay for it because uh, you are the messenger from God. <laughs> so when everything happens in our lives, 
that happens directly from God. We may see, yeah, it was our boss that gave us a paycheck. It's really our this and our family and that, that, that. Everything happens from God. Sometimes we see it more clearly than others, but the bottom line is that everything happens from God. Whether it's the good, whether it's the bad, whether it's the scary, whether it's the unknown, everything happens from God. This is the aspect, when you live your life that way, when you realize that everything's from God, that's bitachon, that's when you internalize that aspect. The, you know, when somebody goes, and somebody, you know, goes, let's say, into a hospital, and he has to go into surgery, you know, they, they have to go, and, you know, they have to be put under, and I, I remember my daughter had to go, you know, get an endoscopy, and I remember, like, she had to go and be placed under an anesthesia. I was so scared. I was like, look, she had to go, and she, like, I was there until, like, they put her under, and she had to go, and she had to use, like, a gas mask, you know, to get the laughing gas until they started with the, you know, with the IV and whatnot, and they told her to count down from 10, and she's going to go under. She was little at that time, and I was... You know, I was like petrified. I'm like, you know, I'm like sharing my legs, you know, like I'm there, I'm, I'm davening. And she starts laughing uncontrollably. <laughs> and, uh, and, and she is, she is having the best time. And, but I'm like, what's going on? You know, like I'm like nervous. She's relaxing. What happened? I told her, I'm like, go. This is what you need to do. The doctors are going to take care of you. So she's not nervous. Because her father told her this is what she needs to do. Her mother told her this is what she needs to do. So she's relaxed. She's going and she's, you know, who knows what's going to, you know, God forbid, what could happen when somebody goes under. Like, but she's going because she has full emunah and bitachon that, you know, my father told me to do this. I mean, I, you know, and I, you know there's, a, there's a hospital. This is where, you know, this is how it's supposed to happen. And she has full control, full, like, like, full, like, complete relaxation. Like, when you go, when you live your life with complete emunah and bitachon, your life, there's no worries. Yes, you have to do your ishtadut. Yes, you have to take care of your responsibilities. But you're living your life with happiness. You're living with your life with tranquility. You're not worried about things that are beyond your capabilities to do something. Like the famous saying goes, if you have, if you, when you're worrying about something, if there's something that you can do about it, then do it. If you can't, then worrying is not going to help you. Now, the question is, so how do you get to that level? How do you go and increase your munah and bitachon? How do you take that and internalize it? So, Obviously we know through the Torah that we have the tefillah and the Torah to help go and internalize this. This is prayer and Torah study. Now, there was once a, uh, a prankster, very famous prankster, that he went into, he was traveling, and he went into a certain town. And the way that he used to go in the olden days, you go into the, into the synagogue, and then hopefully somebody would go and you know, host you for, for Shabbat. So he goes over to the, to the Gabbai, uh, and he says, you know, I need a place for, for Shabbat. And he says, well, there is a very wealthy individual. Very wealthy individual. You could go to him, but you're not going to be able to eat because the guy doesn't stop talking. He doesn't let you take a spoonful in your mouth. He doesn't talk your ear off the entire time. He says, that's the only one we have. Do you want it? He's like, yeah, don't worry about it. I got this. I'll take care of it. Don't worry. Set me up with him. He says, fine. He sets him up with this wealthy guy. And true to the guy's word, the second that he gets home from the synagogue, from shul, he gets over there, they make kiddush, and all of a sudden the wealthy guy starts bombarding him with questions. So where are you from? Uh, Jewish geography. So he says, well, you know, where, where are you from? He says, oh, I'm from a place in Lemberg. I'm from a certain place. And he's like, oh, do you know uh, this so-and-so person? And he's like, yeah, yeah. I, I actually do know him. Uh, this prankster tells him. And then the first, as he's saying this, the first course is being served. So he starts putting it, uh, stuff in his plate. So the rich guy says, so tell me, tell me about him. He says, oh, that guy, he, he's dead. And he starts eating. <laughs> And he's like, he's what? He's like, yeah, and with a mouthful of like, right. He's like, yeah, he's dead. Uh, and he keeps on eating. And the guy, the rich guy's like, I just like saw him a month ago. And he calls over his wife. Did you hear? This guy's dead. Then you know the guy that he did toy. And and the wife is like, what? He's dead. And he's like, yeah, he's dead. And, you know, he's like, and he's guy, this, this prankster is like, keeps on eating. Then the second course comes out. After they fin recu recuperate, they're like, wait, Lemberg, like, do you know uh, so and so? This guy. And he's like, yeah, uh, he's dead too. And he takes the next serve and he starts putting it on his plate. And he's like, he's dead too? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I don't know, he's dead also. And he's like, you have got to be kidding. He calls the wife over, he's like, did you hear? This guy's also dead. He's like, what's going on with this down? And meanwhile, he finishes up his entire second course. By the third course, he says, listen, was it, what about the rabbi? I know the rabbi very well in the city. He's like, oh, he says, you know, the prankster goes like the rabbi. Yeah, he's dead too. And he goes and he takes, and this, this wealthy guy is like, wait a minute, he's like, is everybody dead to you? He's like, when I'm eating, everybody's dead to me. <laughs> he's like, I focus. This guy, this ranger had one goal. His goal was what? Food. I'm gonna go get food. The world is dead until I finish my, my goal. My, my focus is to get that food, and I'm gonna get it. 
afterwards, okay, then we can talk about it. He's like, until that time, what's the mashal over here? You have over here people that go, and when you are going, and when you're learning Torah, when you're praying, the entire world should be dead to you. There should be nobody else, it's a, it's a level, there should be nobody else other than God. The whole world, when you go and you sit down to learn, or you sit down to go and say to Elim, you sit down, there should be no bother, the entire world doesn't exist. That's the level that you have to work on. That's a level that we all have to achieve to. This, you know, we want to get closer to, we want to get closer to God, we want to have this level of Emunah B'Tachon. When you're going and you're speaking to God, make it real. When it becomes real, then everything else falls apart. If you have um, this, this audience, one-on-one -on -one with the most powerful person in the world, are you going to start in your mind thinking, what about this, what about, no, you're focused on your goal. You're focused on your tactic. You've got to be like this prankster. You have to put everybody else in the nicest way possible, dead. And then you pray, you do whatever you need to do. Afterwards, everybody is triatametim. Everybody could come back to life and then you could talk about it. But you have to put that, that level of, of, of tangibility of when you're speaking to God. This is what Rabbi Shimshon Pinkus goes and says. There's something noted, is noted as Yirat HaDorot, where the generations, as it goes further down through history, the, the level is not as high. So you have the, Tana, the Tanaim, the people in the Mishnah were on a very high level. The Amorim were also on a very high level, but lower than the, than, the, than the Tanaim. And then it keeps on going and going. Now if you have like a rabbi nowadays that is about to give a Halacha Psak, God tells you something, and then he finds out that Mishnah Bua says something else. He's going to change it to whatever the Mishnah Bua says, because he realized that the generation before him, the Chafetz Chaim, the Mishnah, Bua, they are on a higher level than him, and he's going to bend, you know, to that, to that, uh, that level. This is also why something very interesting. In, in, you know, when dealing in times of the Beit Hamikdash, there was no sidul. Why? Why was there no sidul? All of a sudden, now you need a sidul, because back then God was so real to them, so real that they didn't need a sidul. They were able to talk. It says nowadays. We feel like we're talking to a wall. When you talk to a wall, you need a sidul. It says when you're not talking, when you're talking to someone real, someone tangible reality, then all of a sudden the sidul, the, the, obviously there's different aspects that's needed besides that for the sidul, but there's a reality that comes in. It says Rabbi Shemesh because you know what happened in the olden days? The, the, the generations that will come, God was so real to them. And he says specifically in women. Women more so, you could notice this more so in men. So men, let's say he, had, he goes and gives an example of Vilna Gaon. So Vilna Gaon used to learn for 20 hours a day. So fine, he learned for 20 hours a day, but what about his wife? Look at a Friday afternoon, what was she doing? Was she learning Gemara? She was probably sitting in the kitchen and she was baking, uh, you know, kugel or whatever it is for, Shab you know, for Shabbat. She was baking for Shabbat. So what, her, her kugel will taste a thousand times better than anybody else's today's kugel? Well, most likely, but besides that, <laughs> like what, what was different about the Vilna Gohan's wife and the woman nowadays? And the answer is, it was the realness of God to them, the emunah, how real it was for them. This is what Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai says on his deathbed. He went over and his student says, give us a blessing, tell, you know, give us something. And he says, may God be real to you, may you have fear of God like you have fear of people. I said, that's it? I said, halivai that you will have the fear of God like fear of people. When you're going, and if, the, the easiest example that I can give you, imagine you're walking in the street and you're having a video camera, you know, record you. How are you going to act differently? You're going to act completely different. But you know that God is seeing everything. But God is not as real as a video camera walking with a crew right behind you. God is not as real as a person. Says Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, if you have the Yerach the fear of heaven, as if the reality that God is right there, you're going to be okay. You're going to be good. When we look at a life, we look at a table, we look at a chair, we look at a camera. These are reality. These are things that are tangible. These are things that are, that are real. When we pray, unfortunately, we don't feel it as real as a chair. When you're sitting down on a chair, you're not nervous that you're going to fall. You're not nervous that the, you know, unless you're drinking, you're not nervous that the whole world is going to tip outside. You have this reality that you're comfortable with. But when you're praying to God, all of a sudden it's, it's a different level. It's like, okay, fine, maybe yes, maybe not. It's a di it's reality did not come in, become something that's a tangible, tangible fact. Now, this is where we are dealing with the, de the generation of the olden days, the generation of, you know, nowadays. The wife of the Vilna Gaon, God for her was real as a cheer is to you. It was real. It was something tangible. For us, it's something that's unfortunately, it's a, it's a level that we need to work with. Now, one of the rabbinic mitzvahs is that we have to go and, and focus on a certain amount of mitzvot every single day. Anybody know what the number is? Six. No, how many, how many uh, I, well, you're right. I misread the question. How many brachot you need to make every day? Very good, thank you, a hundred. So, you know how I realized that I said something wrong by your answer, because I didn't even, I had to like backtrack. Well, why did you say six? Um, and, uh, so, I'm like, six is right for a different question, but it was actually right to my own question, but now my question was wrong. So now, but you know, you got it right. So now, you have to make a hundred bahot. Who, who instituted this? Anybody know? Shlomo. Close. Shlomo. Closer. David. David, very good. 
David, David went and he entered this. What happened over here? There was a magifah, there was a plague. There were a hundred Jews dying every single day. And David HaMelech went and he instituted a hundred bachot a day. And once he instituted a hundred bachot a day, the plague stopped. The Jews stopped dying. So now, we have to understand something very interesting. You know, it's been Rosh Hashim Pincus. That he goes and he says that, what's, what's, you know, what's going on over here with the bachot? That when you have, um, when you love somebody, when you really care about somebody, when that person hurts you, oh, it hurts so much more than when somebody that you don't care about or you don't love you know, as much. So the aspect over here is the more that you love, the more fire is going to be over here. So you have a father to a son, a sibling, a, you know, you know, a child, you know, friends, you know, partners. The closer that you are, the more that it hurts you when they did something you know, that, that, may, that may have affected you. And there was a story that happened during the time of, of Rabbi Kiva Eger that there was a very, very prominent wedding that was happening. And everybody got invited. It was like no months in advance. And they came right before the chupa. And right before the chupa, the, there was two witnesses that came and said that the, 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 the wedding can't happen. Why? There is something wrong with the bridegroom, whatever it is. There's something wrong over there. There's something that's unfit for marriage. And it's got uh, uh, to be, be canceled. And they went and they ended up canceling, uh, canceling the wedding. But they ended up sending the question all to, to the, the chachamim. They sent, it, they sent this question to the chassam sofer. And the Chassam Sofer sends it back quickly and he says, find out if the witnesses are related to the, you know, any of the families. If they're related, then the, you know, if let's say they're related to the people that they testified against with, then the, then the testimony goes out the window and they could go and get married. And they went and they found out that they were related actually. And they went and they ended up getting married. So everybody went over and it says, how did you know? How did you know? How did you know to go and ask that maybe the witnesses are related? So he said it's very simple. He said that everybody knew about this wedding in months in advance. How come nobody ever came two months ago and noted that something is wrong over here? He says to come when everybody's invited, everybody came, the wedding's about, the chuppah is about to start and then spill this beans? He says that type of cruelty can only be if it's blood related. He says it cannot be if it's just somebody else. Somebody else would have came you know, well, you know, you know, prior in, a, you know, in advance to it. Because what happens is when people are close, the fire really burns. And this is what happens with the greatest closest that you could have is a husband and a wife. And that's why the Sheol Shachim always compares our relationship between God and, and the Jewish nation as a husband, and, a husband and a wife. Now, what do you know? What happens over here? When a husband and wife, when they get married, they love each other like, like to, to no extent. So how is it that unfortunately, let's say cases where a year, two, three, four, five years go by and they get divorced. And the amount of disgusting things that comes out from each side and the amount of foul play that comes in, how can they go for someone they love so much? The answer is because when you love, when you have such a powerful emotion towards someone, it goes the other way as well. So what happened over here, says Rav He goes and he says that in the time of the Magifa, in the time of any Magifa, you look at the Holocaust, you look at um, the Tachvatat, the, the, um, you look at the Spanish Inquisition, there's something going on over here. There's an alienation between the husband and the wife. There's an alienation between the Jewish nation and between God. So the first step that you need to do in order to, to, to combat this is to get a ceasefire. Now how do you get a ceasefire? So when you go and you look at a husband and wife, even if they love each other, but if they can't say, I love you, they can't say good morning, they can't say nice things to each other, they can't communicate, then there's nothing to talk about. You have to start off with communication. So in order to promote this relationship between God and the Jewish people, David Amalek, King David went and says, I have to go and, and start off this communication between God and the Jewish nation. How am I going to do that? A hundred bachat. Start talking to God. Start doing it. What is, what is a bachat? Bachat is you're saying thank you. When was the last time you said thank you God for the ear that you breathe? Now even more so that the ear is not full of coronavirus. You have to say thank you for so many things. When was the last time you went and you... you says something very, very scary. He says, you want to know when the last time the majority of people made a real bachat? I was in kindergarten. That's when they made a real bacha. You see, my little kids, when they make a bacha, better than anybody else, loudest with kavanah. I mean, they don't know what they're saying, right? It's baruch Hashem. You know, can I have uh, you know that thing? I'm like, you're making a bacha. Okay, and they finish the bacha, and then they're going and they're talking, and then they're walking down the street, and then they remember they have to drink and eat. But when they say the words, oh, forget about it. It's it, they. That is a level of bacha. When was the last time that you realized that everything comes from God when you make a bacha? You know, like you know, fast forward, you know, times if you think I speak fast, then listen how you say a bachot. And if you say a bachot fast, then you can't say that I speak fast. <laughs> okay? So until then, um, next comment that I got to really put that. Next comment that I get about me speaking fast, how fast do you speak to God? How could, what, what is your level that you have? And the, and the problem here is, is that. 
we stop talking to God because God is not real to us. He's not real. I mean, maybe he is because we think, we know, yeah, God is everything out of God. But it's not real because if it's real, then when you're praying, there's nothing else. The world is dead. And when you're going, you're making a bachad, the world, you're focusing on that. And uh, granted, it's easy for me to say this, but this is a level that we have to go. Like we, the person on the wheelbarrow, it's one step at a time. The next bachad that you make, focus on it. Get a relationship with God. Start talking to God. You know what happened when... King David instituted this, all of a sudden the relationship between the Jewish nation and, and God all of a sudden started, the plague stopped, instantly, the, state, the plague stopped. And since then it was instituted for generations to come, that every single you know, day we have to go and we have to make a hundred bachot, that even on Shabbat we have to institute more, you know, extra stuff to go and make up for those a hundred bachot. So now, when we go and we realize in our day-to-day -day lives, generally people are very polite. People are nice people. Even atheists, they're nice, they go and they say thank you, they say I'm sorry, they say excuse me. When you go and you're getting something from God, when was the last time that you really meant it? Like, God, thank you. God, I appreciate it. When did, you, you know, when did God become so real to you that you were like, wait a minute, I just got something. Like, thank you, God. Baruch Hashem. Like, when was the last time that something, like, slightly good, you found a parking spot in Brooklyn, right? That's like, you should, you know, give a sudat adaya. You really, like, it's a level, you know? Like, when you're going, you'd be like, well, God, thank you. Imagine you found it on the first time without circling 16,000 times. Imagine what that, you know, like, you know, what the, the level that, that, that of, of gratitude that a person has to have. But granted, it's not as real. So this is what we need to do. We need to work on, and I'm not saying, again, I'm not, I'm on no level to say, this is why the coronavirus is here, because you didn't make a hundred bahot. I don't know. I, I really don't know why. But one thing is that I do know is that God sent something that we have to work on ourselves. We have to do, fix something. Maybe what we need to fix, uh, fix uh, is, and, and work on is something to getting that, that relation between us and God, making that real, making that, that, that so tangible that once you have that, you're not scared of anything. I want to finish off with one final story that there was a guy, there was two, the two yeshiva boys, that they decided they're going to work on emunah and bitachon. They're going to go and they're going to study. And they said, listen, we'll go our separate ways, we'll come back here in six months, a half a year, and we'll compare notes, see who thought it better. And they said, fine. They each went on their se separate ways. We'll call one, the first boy, Uven, the second boy, Shimon. Uven goes and he studies everything on emunah and bitachon. He takes all the sfarim, he goes and he studies it. He knows it, but that doesn't stop him. He goes and he memorizes it. And he goes and he knows everything and he goes back. And he knows everything inside and out. Oh, ask him any question on this, he'll answer to you with pure clarity. Then the next boy, Shimon, he also starts the same way. He goes and he starts learning it. But he says, well, you know what, like I'm learning it, it's here. But like, do I feel it in here? So he decides he's going to take this a step further. Behind the yeshiva, there was a forest. And he decides he's going to walk into the forest. I'm not saying that you should do this and go into the forest, but this is what this boy did. He went into the forest, and at night, he goes into the forest, it's very scary. You know, it's like going out in Brooklyn at night, right? It's very scary. Um, and he goes and he takes a few steps into the forest and he's nervous and he's like, no, and Munabi, he works on himself, works on and then he runs back. He can't. The next day, he goes in a little bit further and he's working and Munabi, he's thinking about it, he's internalizing his point. By after a few months, he's going into the forest, he's calm. He's he has tranquility, he has Minuchat and Nefesh. He is going without any problem. Now, I'm not saying you should put yourself in danger, but this is what this boy did. And six months, they go by. And Ruben comes in and he says, I memorized every source, I know every location, I know every detail there is to know what the sages have told us about Amin Abid Khan. And the guy says, that's very nice, you know, I also learned it. Um, he says, but uh, let's, let's make this practical. So the first boy says, okay, what do you want to do? He says, let's take a walk in the forest, let's see how we have the level of Amin Abid Khan. He says, that's a great idea. So they both walk in. Again, Ruben is the one that has intellectualized everything. Shimon is the one that actually put this into practice. They walk in. All of a sudden, you know, they hear, a, you know, a twig crack. And, you know, the first one looks around and, you know, like, like a squirrel, you know, <laughs> like starts steering. He's like, do you hear that? He's like, yeah, don't worry about it. And he keeps on walking. He's like, no, no, wait a minute. And, uh, and, and meanwhile, Shimon, you know, hears the heart rate of Oven. And, and he's like, listen, this is a raise, you know, like you got to go lower the music over here. And he's like, he's like, no, we can't do this. It's very scary. It's going over there. Within a few seconds, the guy, the first guy can't make it. He runs out of the forest. The other guy stays, uh, a few hours later he goes out, he does, does something he's done to do, who knows what he's done. Right, maybe he was wrestled. Right, he goes, comes back out, and, um, and he sees his friend, he says, what happened over there? I thought you had such a munah bitachon, you were at such a level. He's like, I thought I also did, I can't explain it, I don't know why. 
And the, and the second boy told him, he says, you want to know why? He says, because you went and you learned all about Emunah. You learned all about Abitachon, but it stayed over here. It stayed in your brain. It stayed intellectually. You didn't turn it into something that's, that's true knowledge. You didn't turn it into something that really means something for you. That when you, and how do you know that? When you come to a situation where you're unsure, you're uncertain, but if you realize that you did everything that you could do, then you have Emunah Abitachon, that you need to go and live your life. And this is what the lesson that I think that we should take away from today is that yes, we have to do a Yishtadlut. There's the coronavirus is out there and you have to take precautions. You have to make sure that you wash your hands and you wash your hands for 20 seconds with antibacterial you know, soap. Do it right, you have to do it right. And if make, wearing masks makes you feel better, whatever it is, do whatever it is. Do the Yishtadlut that you're required to do. But after that, are you gonna sit there and have this you know, worrying and I'm not, da, da. after you did what you need to do, physically, the most important thing is, is what are you gonna do now spiritually? What is it that you are going to go and take upon yourself? You want my, the lesson that I'm trying to give for tonight, what you should take out, is get a closer connection to God. Because what happens is when you get a closer connection to God, you say the bachot, you say you become, everything becomes so real to you that by default, the coronavirus is not going to scare you. By default, you're going to be more relaxed. And then, B'zat Hashem, with the relaxation that you will have, you'll have a stronger immune system. You don't have to you know, inject in yourself vitamin C which again wasn't proven anything, and you don't have to drink bleach or snort cocaine or whatever it is that people are telling you that it's good for you to do. Um, uh, you know, you have to focus on what you're doing spiritually. You do your shadot, you do your physical, your spiritual thing, after that it's all in God's hands. And if it's all in God's hands, then all of a sudden you're happy, you're relaxed. Okay, so my children are home. Okay, so this and that. Okay, so whatever it is that's going to happen. You know, Baruch Hashem, you go over there, it's going to change your life. And Bezad Hashem, with this merit, may the entire coronavirus be disintegrated, evaporated, and be null and void, and we shouldn't have to worry about it. Not us, not our friends, not our family, no one. I mean, we all know only good things. Open up to any questions. No questions? Wow. That's, that's a, yeah. Okay, well. Hazag Baruch.